Good morning. Welcome back. I'm always surprised when people come back. <laughs> but it's our fifth class, and they're treating me like a grown-up now. I get to start the class by myself. So we're good. All right, you know what we're about. We have been talking about what I'll call ancient ideas and discoveries, ancient meaning 1920s, 1940s, 1950s, in which I think astronomers collectively found evidence for life on Mars, all of which was complete bunk. Lichens, moss, algae, chlorophyll, none of it was right. But a lot of it was influenced by the idea that folks thought Mars should have life, that Mars was once wet like the Earth, that Mars did and does have lots of water, that Mars was hospitable to life if you could have put life there, that life could still exist on Mars today if you put it in the right place. That right place might be underneath the ice caps, it might be in caves, it's not on the surface. But life could exist on Mars. So the idea that influenced the early 20th century astronomers and got them to do bad science, or science badly, okay, was a reasonable idea. The hypothesis that Mars could host or could have hosted life is reasonable. They just hadn't proved it, even though they thought multiple times they had. Today, I want to jump forward to more recent stuff. That's what we're going to do today and in our last class next week to talk about some of the evidence which is disputable, but not irrefutable, as plausible evidence that Mars once did or does host life. The idea really is possible, all right? So let's get started. This guy, you guys know, Carl Sagan. He's with the Viking lander. He's not actually on Mars. This is in the Mojave Desert in California. And I can say to you that Carl Sagan said billions and billions, and you guys know what I'm talking about. My students today have no clue. <laughs> it's very disappointing. But Carl Sagan was a very important voice from the early 1960s through the 70s in getting NASA interested in missions to Mars that would look for evidence of life. As we know from class last time, he was part of the team that put the final nail in the coffin of the whole algae, lichen, moss business on Mars, that it's just wind-blown sand changing the color of the surface, that that's all wrong. There was no lichens, no moss. But Sagan, nevertheless, was convinced that life on Mars was a possibility. All right. If anything gets on a postage stamp, it's important. So <laughs> here's the Viking missions to Mars when stamps cost 15 cents. I thought that was expensive, didn't it? July 20th, 1976, Viking 1 landed on Mars, on a place called the Chrysi Planitia, a flat plain, and we're going to see where that is. And two weeks, a month later, Viking 2 landed on Mars, on the other side of Mars, on Utopia Planitia. The landing sites were intentionally chosen to be safe places. They were flat. They were smooth. They were planes. That's what the planitia means, the flat bottom of an ancient impact crater. Because we didn't want these missions to descend to the surface of Mars and then fall over. Then you don't get to do anything. So they went to safe places. The Viking missions also included spacecraft that went into orbit around Mars. So there were Viking orbiters and Viking landers. The orbiters imaged almost the entire surface of Mars, such that after the Mo Viking mission, we knew the surface of Mars better than we know the surface of the Earth. Most of the Earth is covered by ocean. It's hard to know what the bottom of the ocean looks like. So these were important missions, these two missions. The locations for the landers, Chrysi Planitia on the left, Utopia on the right. These are in the northern hemisphere. Remember, the blue is not water now but the blue is low elevation, so if Mars had enough water, that's where the water would go. It would fill up the northern hemisphere. So two locations on Mars on opposite hemispheres for getting you oriented again. This big blob right here, that's the biggest mountain on Mars. These are three big volcanic mountains on Mars. This is Valles Marineris, the big crack on Mars. 
All right. So that's where we went. Carl Sagan invented a word. It's kind of a neat word, macrobe. <coughs> Macrobes, he said, would be life forms that are visible to the eye. Frogs, giraffes, worms, zebras. And he said, there is no reason to exclude from Mars organisms ranging in size from ants to polar bears. And there are even reasons why large organisms might do better than small organisms on Mars. They might do better because the gravity is weaker, so you could have your weight doesn't squish you so you can have bigger animals. So he argued very forcefully that the Viking landers should have cameras on them. Most of the science teams said, we don't need cameras on Mars. We're going to do experiments. We don't need to look at anything. And Sagan said, there might be macrobes. So we need a camera. Well, the camera gave us nice pictures. This is the very first picture that Viking took on Mars. And the very first thing that the Viking Science teams did as they looked at that picture and they said, no macroscopic Martians. Okay? <laughs> and that was pretty much it. We got some nice pictures of the surface of Mars. Here's a close-up of the red dirt and the rocks on the surface. But the camera was of very little value. The camera showed that in the morning there was frost on the ground and in the evening the frost was gone. But the main experiments on the Viking missions were the biology experiments. But we first had to establish that there were no macrobes on the surface. There are no macrobes on the surface. All right. Harold Klein was the chief of the biology team for the Viking missions. He, his background was microbiology. He was named around 1968 or so as the leader for the Viking missions. These missions to other planets take a long time to plan. So this thing went to Mars in 76. It was launched in 75. The planning began in the late 60s. There were four important experiments that were part of the biology project. The gas exchange experiment, the label release experiment, the pyrolytic release experiment, and the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer experiment. And amazingly, all four of those experiments fit into a volume of space about one foot on a side, one cubic foot for those four experiments. The payload had to be very lightweight because you had to land this thing on Mars. And you had to be very careful in how much weight you put in the spacecraft so that you could settle it down to the surface carefully. So a very small, compact set of experiments. All right, the first experiment, the gas exchange experiment. Vance Oyama was the head of this experiment team. His background was in biochemistry. He was the chief of life detection, as they called it, at NASA Ames. NASA Ames is NASA's research center just south of San Francisco. In the gas exchange, the lander had this robotic arm that reached out and scraped up some dirt. So that's the actual scraping of the Martian soil by that lander arm. There's another scrape. So it reached out, grabbed some dirt. This is actually hard. With 2018 technology, a whole lot easier, easier, but in 1976, this was hard. At the same time that we sent this Viking mission to Mars, the Russians had decided, then the Soviet Union, the Russians had decided that they lost the race to the moon, they lost the race to Mars, but they were going to win the race to Venus. So they sent a mission, the Venera missions, a whole series of missions to Venus, trying to land a mission on the surface of Venus that would do this, reach out, grab some dirt from Venus, put it into the lander, and make some measurements. One of the problems with Venus is that the surface temperature is more than 900 degrees, so you have to send a big refrigerator. And the refrigerator melts quickly, so you have to do your experiment quickly. The way the Russians designed their space missions was the antithesis of the way the US does it. The way we do it drives everybody nuts because someone makes a proposal, a whole team of people get involved in the proposal, there are committees that vet the proposal, they compete with other proposals. Once you get tasked by NASA to do something, there are reviews and reviews and reviews and reviews. And when it's all said and done, it usually works, usually. For the Russians, the way it works is the head of the space agency said, design me a mission to Venus. So you go into your room and you design a mission to Venus. So the guy who designed the Venera mission to Venus to do the soil sample, 
designed something just like this, and when it landed on Venus, amazingly, it landed on Venus. It survived for 59 minutes before it melted. The robot arm reached out, reached down to the ground, and hit the foot of the spacecraft. <laughs> because it wasn't long enough. There was no design review to, for anyone to say, are you sure the arm is long enough to reach the dirt? Okay. And then the spacecraft melted. There was no time to reprogram it. Okay. But this worked. We sent these spacecraft to Mars. They landed. They reached out. They got some dirt, and they did their experiments. The same dirt that the, lander, that the arm reached out was for all four of the experiments. So in this experiment, the gas exchange experiment, they did three experiments, one after another. This cartoon of the experiment, you have the dirt in this little sample here. There's water underneath the, the dirt. The water and the dirt are not actually physically in contact. The water is separate from and below the dirt. You have a little device here that can inject some stuff into the dirt when it's time. And then you have a detector for detecting stuff. The first test they did was, are there any gases that come out of the dirt before you add anything to it, before you expose it to water, before you inject any nutrients into it? And they got nothing from that. The second experiment, they put the water underneath the dirt, and they waited. Nothing happened. So then they did the third experiment. In the third experiment, they injected this chicken soup, a bunch of amino acids, into the dirt. The water is you know, filling up the air in here. It's being absorbed by the dirt. And something happened. The question is, what happened? The hypothesis was that if there's anything alive in the dirt, it will absorb the water. The water will make it start doing things. It will grow. It will breathe in and out. It might even reproduce. There would be signatures of that activity as the gases go in and out of the biological stuff. What gases? Well, it might be carbon monoxide, or methane, or hydrogen, or oxygen, or nitrous oxide, or hydrogen sulfide. So they were looking for all of those things. Two and a half hours after the third part of this experiment began, they got a big burst of oxygen. It didn't continue, but they got this big burst of oxygen. What caused that? That's the big question. The next experiment, the label release experiment, the guy in charge of that, this guy, Gil Levin, he was not a biologist. He was an environmental engineer. He had started his own company in Maryland called Biospherics Incorporated. And for Biospherics, this is the beginning of the environmental movement in the late 60s, early 70s. He was inventing devices to detect bacteria in water to see if the water was contaminated. And he was hired to essentially design that same kind of thing as an experiment for Mars. He's still in business. He's, I think, 96 years old. His company is now Spherix. I don't know how good the company is. That's not my bailiwick. But he still does this stuff. In this experiment, the robotic arm again reached out, got some dirt, dumped it into his little device. So we have some dirt down here, Martian soil. In his experiment, he's trying to detect radioactivity. The idea is he injected his chicken soup, his amino acid and carbohydrate compound into the dirt, dropped it into the dirt. In his chicken soup, it had been pre-made on Earth such that the carbon in the amino acids was carbon-14 instead of carbon-12. And carbon-14 is radioactive. And the idea was, if there's anything living in the dirt, it would take in the amino acids, take in the carbon-rich compounds, synthesize it, and then exhale carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide would be carbon-14 rich carbon dioxide. And they would detect that with a Geiger counter and measure how much activity there was. This is a graph of their results. So the vertical axis is how much radioactivity counts per minute is the CPM. The horizontal axis, souls from injection. A soul is a Martian day. So this is how many days after you injected the nutrients into the soil. The bottom line is the background, all right? About 500 counts per background. This first tick mark is 5,000. That line's about 500. You get about 500 radioactive clicks of your Geiger counter 
even if there's nothing alive, even if there's no activity. That's just your background signal. Anything above that means something else is happening. And within a few hours of starting the experiment, their number was within nine hours, the level of radioactivity had reached 4,500 counts per minute. And after one day, we're up at about 10,000 counts per minute. It continues to rise, but not as steeply. That's a lot of radioactivity. What is causing that? That became the question. These two results were part of the experimental results on day one of the Viking mission. It lands on July 20th. In the next week, as soon as it's landed, they start doing these experiments. July 31st, so it's 11 days after this thing has set foot or set whatever it has to land on down on the Martian surface, NASA held a press conference. Harold Klein, the head of the team, led the press conference. And he reported to the press that one of the bio Viking biology experiments, the gas exchange experiment, had already yielded, in his words, at least preliminary evidence for a very active surface material. This was the release of oxygen. He then said the second experiment, the label release experiment, had generated a response in the form of the high levels of radioactive carbon that looked, he said, very much like a biological signal. Big ideas. He then continued, he says, both results must be viewed very carefully. We believe there is something in the surface, some chemical or physical entity which is affording the surface material a great deal of activity and may, in fact, mimic, let me emphasize that, mimic, in some respects, biological activity. All right, jackpot, right? We found life on Mars. He was, he was trying to be careful. His audience was not receptive to careful, all right? <laughs> The reporters, I don't think these are actual reporters from that press conference. <laughs> this guy looks familiar, but I don't know who he is. Okay. Oh, Rafael Nadal. So he's not a reporter, but he's got a goofy face, so he works for me. All right. The reporters at this press conference should have been embarrassed. Some of the questions they asked included, one of them said, was this evidence for photosynthetic activity on Mars? You have to think a little bit about this, but this experiment took place inside a one-foot cube inside the lander, completely shielded from any light. It was in the dark. Photosynthesis occurs when sunlight hits something. You can't have photosynthesis without the photo part of it. Okay? <laughs> Another reporter asked, could the animals have produced oxygen? Well, what do I do? Breathe in the oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. Animals don't breathe out oxygen. So the reporters, I think, hadn't been well prepped for the press conference. So that's partly NASA's fault. But the reporters weren't ready, but they were ready to go to town with the results. Yes. Why did they decide on those four experiments and not other experiments? Or the, or, or the soup they put in. There were large teams of people who competed for the opportunity of having a biology experiment go to Mars. Some set of NASA review panels looked at the various proposals and said, Vance Ayama's proposal, that's a good one. Gilbert Levin's proposal, that's a good one. Let's do those. It would be partly because the experiment was well conceived in the eyes of the reviewers who thought something about how biology might work on Mars at the time. In part, it's because the experiment had the potential to fit into the little cubby inside that one cubic foot volume. Some other experiments might have, might have been heavier and bigger and therefore couldn't fly. So these experiments were selected by panels of experts who decided that they were the right experiments, that they complemented each other, that they looked at Mars in a way that made sense in 1975 for trying to discover whether there's biology there.
In 2018, we might design different experiments, but we have to you know, go back to 1968, which is really when these were designed. Yes, sir. Okay, the question is, were they short-sighted in assuming that whatever they'd be looking for to measure on Mars would be the same kinds of things you might find on Earth? In terms of the composition of Mars, it's the same as the Earth. The carbon, the oxygen, the silicon, the nitrogen, the magnesium, the calcium, the, you name it. All this, the, the elemental things that make up the Earth are almost identical in percentage to that what makes up Mars. So in terms of elements, we're looking for the right stuff. In terms of thinking about life, we are very limited in our ability to think about what life might be like beyond the Earth. They were looking for chemical-based life. They weren't looking for life that was pure magnetic fields, for instance. I don't even know how to conceive of that. That's the problem. We're looking for life that we might be able to identify as living. And we know of life as being carbon-based, because carbon is the backbone of every living thing on Earth. Carbon is the most versatile element in combining with other elements. We know that if the living thing somehow has designed its personal space to protect itself and isolate itself from the surrounding environment, it needs the equivalent of a cell wall. And you need to transport things in and out of that environment. To do that, you need liquids. Liquids are the transportation mechanism that makes life work, that makes the chemistry happen. So doing this in the presence of water makes sense. The production or the consumption of oxygen and carbon dioxide, that's the way life on Earth behaves. Looking for that makes sense. So we were looking for life that would behave in ways that life on Earth would behave. That's the only thing we knew how to do. If life on Mars exists and behaves in a completely different way, you then have to ask, could we even recognize that? There's no sense looking for something you don't know how to look for. You might discover something you don't, have to, you don't know how to look for accidentally if you make enough other measurements. But you can't go looking for something that you don't even know what you're looking for. So they were looking for something that was similar in the basic biological behaviors as primitive life on Earth would be. It's a very fair question, but we just don't know how to operate in any other way, at least right now. Even with modern ideas trying to think about how life might behave on planets around other stars, and can we design our experiments not to go there, but to point our telescopes at the atmospheres of planets around other stars, what would we look for to see if there's life there? We're thinking the same way. Yes. Could there have been macrobes on other parts of Mars that we didn't see? I'm going to say no. But of course, the Viking landers had very small footprints. Their eyes only could look out a kilometer, a few kilometers in any one direction. Then the curvature of the planet made it impossible to see any further. There were two Viking landers on opposite sides of the planet, but they were in similar environments. Neither of them saw anything. But we also had the orbiters. And they, the orbiters were taking pictures of the surface at fairly high resolution. The smallest thing they could see was about 8 meters across, so 25, meters, 25 feet across. So they couldn't see worms or birds or giraffes or elephants. They're all smaller than that. But if there were herds of elephants, they'd see that. Right? If life was active on the surface and had influenced structures on the surface, They'd see that if you had large plains full of gopher holes, you'd see that that region was geologically, geographically different than other regions. But yeah, it is conceivable that these two landers didn't see the microbes that were hiding somewhere else. The, the absence of those in these pictures doesn't prove the absence of microbes everywhere. But everything else we know about Mars, nobody else thought we should be looking for microbes. Only Carl Sagan. Okay? No one thought it even likely 
even barely likely, but Carl Sagan did, and he was very influential. And putting a camera on the spacecraft actually made sense. Let's take a picture of the ground. Right? So they put the camera on. But one picture was enough to satisfy everybody. It's interesting to see the surface, yes. So the camera was helpful for that. All right. So the reporters weren't well trained. They asked dumb questions, but they're in charge of what goes in the newspaper. So we get this. I don't have the picture of the headline, but page one of the New York Times, August 1st, scientists say data could be first hint of life on the planet. And I think I've got the date wrong because these weren't both August 1st. But test by Vikings strengthens hint of life on Mars. The reporters believed that they were being told that the evidence was very strong and that there was life on Mars. The evidence was weaker than that. Yes, some oxygen came out. Yes, they detected radioactivity from carbon. They probably held their press conference a bit too soon. The Viking biology team concluded after some additional work doing experiments in laboratories on Earth which they hadn't had enough time to do. Everything was rushed to get these experiments designed, prototyped, built, cleaned, put in the spacecraft, launched. They didn't have enough time to take their duplicate version of the instrument and put it in the lab and do the thousands of tests they needed to do to truly find out how these instruments behave. This was not, this is the part of it where the science wasn't well done because of the rush to get to Mars. They concluded as we know, whoops, that the experiments confirm the presence of a, on the surface of a very reactive oxidizing species. That doesn't have anything to do with life. It just means there's something on the surface that spits out oxygen. What does the oxidizing species mean? It's a kind of molecule that produces oxygen when you put water in contact with the soil, or that produces carbon dioxide when you put water containing inorganic compounds in contact with the soil. Neither experiment requires biological activity. Biological activity is one explanation that could, that could explain both experimental results, or one or the other, but you don't need biology to generate those results. They held another press conference. They said this. You don't need biology to do this. We don't know what's causing it. The headline in the New York Times then was, experiment fails to rule out possible biological processes on Mars. The press wanted there to be life on Mars, just like we all wanted it for 100 years. This headline, though, was not on page one. It was on page 18, where nobody would see it. All right, the next experiment, the pyrolytic release experiment. This means you're using a lot of heat. Norman Horwitz was the head of this experiment. In this experiment, again, you've got some Martian soil. You expose it to some radioactive carbon-bearing gases. You then heat it up. This lamp is heating it up. This is the same sort of thing. You got the dirt, you got the light source, you got the CO2 coming in here. The CO2 is laced with carbon-14 again, so it'll be radioactive. The idea is the soil will pull in the CO and CO2 and metabolize it and then spit out the radioactive carbon. By heating it, what they were doing was making the, the dirt so hot that any gases in the dirt would be forced out. So they injected Martian air into the apparatus. They added their radioactive carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. They then looked to see if any of the carbon had been taken into the soil. That, they'd measure that because when it went into the soil, it would be traded with the carbon that's in the soil and the radioactive carbon would come out. Then they slowly heated the gas. They heated it all the way up to 1175 degrees Fahrenheit. That's really hot. Life doesn't exist at those temperatures, just saying. What they found is the signal that produced the radioactive carbon that kept spitting out the radioactive gases didn't go away. Didn't matter how high the temperature went. If the stuff in the soil that's producing the carbon dioxide that's coming out is biology, then at 1,200 degrees, you've cooked it. And it's, it's not going to do it anymore. So it ought to turn off. So this experiment very, very strongly suggested that the molecules they were detecting 
were naturally abundant in the Martian soil and had nothing to do with life? That was the answer from the pyrolytic release experiment. One more experiment, the gas, gas chromatograph with mass spectrometer experiment, the GCMS experiment. Klaus Beeman was the head of this one. Not a very easy to see picture of it, but it's the same basic thing. You dump some soil in, you, for this one, they bombard the soil with hydrogen, high energy hydrogen particles to try to spall some stuff out of the dirt, and then they measure the ions that are coming out of the dirt with a mass spectrometer to measure how much those ions weigh, that you can then tell what the stuff is composed of. Again, in this experiment, they heated up the soil first to 50 Celsius. I don't know why I go back from Celsius to Fahrenheit, but you got it. 50 Celsius, then 200, then 350, then 500. These are pretty hot. They are hot enough to vaporize any carbon-containing or organic compounds. They then published their paper. This is October 1, 1976, the date on this paper in Science Magazine. Remember, the lander landed on July 20th. July, August, September, this is two weeks, two months and a week later that they're publishing this result, big important result. Two surface samples collected from the Chrysi Planitia region of Mars were heated up to temperatures of 500 degrees, and the volatiles that they evolved were analyzed with a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. Only water and carbon dioxide were detected. This implies that organic compounds have not accumulated to the extent that individual components could be detected at levels of a few parts in a billion by weight in our samples. Proposed mechanisms for the accumulation and destruction of organic compounds are discussed in the light of this limit. What does that mean? That means that to the extent possible, in this soil sample, there are no organic compounds to begin with. There's no DNA molecule. There's no amino acid. There's no biological thing that we would recognize that would be a carbon-containing compound. If there are no organic compounds in the soil, then there's no point in sending a Mars biology experiment to Mars to do the experiments they did. All right? If this experiment had been done first, if NASA had said, let's send a first spacecraft to Mars with this gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, and they did this experiment, they never would have sent the Viking biology experiment. The tests for the first three experiments were silly to do if there's no organic material in the soil in the first place. In 1992, three of the five people we're talking about, the head of the program and two of the three, two of the four in principal investigators wrote an article in which they said, the absence of organic compounds at these two very distant sites, the two lander sites on opposite sides of the planet, demonstrated that there is presently neither biological nor abiological synthesis of organic compounds occurring. What became clear, even during the Viking mission, was that if these experimental results were correct, and there was reason to believe that this was the case, the three biological experiments had essentially lost their original purpose. With no detectable trace of organic matter in the surface material, there was no possibility of finding extant life at the two landing sites. The Viking missions established that there is no life at the two landing sites, although the two sites are 25 degrees apart in latitude and on opposite sides of the planet, they were found to be very similar in their surface chemistry. This similarity reflects the influence of global forces such as extreme dryness, low atmospheric pressure, short wavelength ultraviolet flux, and planet-wide dust storms in shaping the Martian environment. The same forces virtually guarantee that the Martian surface is lifeless everywhere. Bummer, if you want life there. Not everybody agreed. Not everybody, meaning there was one person who disagreed. And that was Gil Levin. He was the head of the something label experiment, the second experiment. All right? He wrote in 1979, a couple years after the mission had ended, Despite all hypotheses to the contrary, the distinct possibility remains that biological activity has been observed on Mars. He saw the radioactivity go up to 10,000 counts in a few hours and stay that way, and he believed that was evidence of life. 
A decade has passed since the first label release Viking biology experiment, this is from 1989, produced an astonishing positive response on Mars. But that response was deemed unconvincing when no organic compounds were found. As a result, many attempts have been made to explain the data from his experiment, the label release data, without invoking life. The dominant theory expounded hydrogen peroxide as a chemical agent, suggesting that it reacted with one of the nutrient compounds to mimic a biological response. This theory was tested and essentially disproved on Mars. There is, in fact, no evidence that it exists on Mars, the hydrogen peroxide, and even if it formed, it would be destroyed by the environment long before it could affect an experiment. We have carefully tested all of the non-biology theories and have found none to be scientifically adequate. We also verified that the GCMS organic detection sensitivity may have missed very low densities of organic matter. It was sensitive down to a few parts per billion. If it's a few parts per trillion, they obviously wouldn't have detected it. It is now our contention that the survival of the label release data, together with other information not previously considered, justifies the conclusion that it is now more probable than not that the label release experiment did, in fact, detect life on Mars. Gil Levin is an outlier, okay? not a liar, but an outlier. Okay? Nobody else believes him. But he has been pushing this idea now for 40 years that his experiment should not be ignored, that the explanations of why the radioactivity was detected in his experiment are all inadequate, and that the only possible explanation is that he did detect life. Is that possible? Maybe. Viking 1 and Viking 2 detected two molecules, one called chloromethane, the other called dichloromethane on Mars. These are organic molecules. They have carbon in them. The interpretation uniformly was that the chloromethane and dichloromethane they detected, they brought with them from Earth, that that was terrestrial contamination. Chris McKay, who works at NASA Ames Research Center, has written that there's a possibility that some of these molecules might be biomarkers. He thinks maybe they're not contaminants. Why does he think that? He did an experiment with some others in which they went to the Atacama Desert in Chile. And it's really hard for me to get this right without actually reading what I wrote, so I won't confuse you. But this is a 2010 article here. He says, they performed an experiment on a handful of dirt taken from the extremely high 13,000 feet and dry Atacama Desert in Chile. After dosing the dirt with perchlorate, which is the negative ion chlorine and oxygen, four oxygen atoms, a very reactive oxidizing chemical containing only chlorine and oxygen, and heating the sample, they detected the presence of two compounds, chloromethane and dichloromethane. Those molecules formed. They weren't already there, but they formed them when they exposed the Atacama Desert dirt to this thing called perchlorate. Both of these newly formed compounds contain both carbon and hydrogen atoms not present in perchlorate. Right? Perchlorate doesn't have the carbon in it, but the reaction pulled the carbon from somewhere and created compounds that are carbon-rich compounds. The carbon atoms must have come from carbon-bearing molecules that were already present in the soil. That is, the formation of chloromethane and dichloromethane is indirect proof. Remember, this is Atacama Desert dirt on Earth. But indirect proof of the presence of organic material in the Atacama Desert, and therefore could tell us that the same thing could happen on Mars. That's McKay. June 7, 2018, so three months ago, NASA had a big announcement in which they said, NASA finds ancient organic material. Forget the mysterious methane, because that's next week. <laughs> to identify organic material in the Martian soil, Curiosity, that's one of our rovers on Mars, Curiosity drilled into sedimentary rocks known as mudstone from four areas in Gale Crater. This mudstone gradually formed billions of years ago from silt that accumulated at the bottom of an ancient lake. The rock samples were analyzed by SAM. That's the scientific experiment acronym for the Curiosity rover. Uh, 
which uses an oven to heat the samples up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit to release organic molecules from the powdered rock. Sam measured small organic molecules that came off the mudstone sample. Fragments of larger organic molecules that don't vaporize easily. In other words, when they crushed it and heated it, pieces of molecules came off, and those were small organic molecules. Those molecules contain sulfur, which could have helped preserve them in the same way sulfur is used to make car tires more durable. Now, the question there is mine. I had no idea you used sulfur to make car tires more durable. Any of you know that? One of you knows that. All right. Talk to him if you've got car problems. Okay? <laughs> the results also indicate organic carbon concentrations on the order of 10 parts per million or more. This is close to the amount observed in Martian meteorites and about 100 times greater than prior detections of organic carbon on Mars' surface. Some of the molecules identified include thiophenes, benzene, toluene, and small carbon chains such as propane and butene. In 2013, Sam detected some organic molecules containing chlorine in rocks at the deepest point in the crater. The new discovery builds on the inventory of molecules detected in the ancient lake sediments on Mars and helps explain why they were preserved. So maybe there really are organic molecules in the Martian soil that Viking was unable to detect. And maybe Gil Levin is right that his experiment detected activity from those organic molecules. And if they're organic molecules, organic molecules themselves are not alive. They don't have to be living things. But the presence of organic molecules strongly suggests at least the possibility that they are the detritus or the active pieces of living things. This means despite 40 years of trying to understand the Viking data, we actually don't understand it yet. The possibility exists, and I would contend it's a very small possibility, but it is not zero, that the Viking landers actually detected evidence of life on Mars. All right, let's move on. Let's go to Antarctica. In December of 1984, Roberta Score, whoops, Roberta Score detect, discovered an, a meteorite in Antarctica. These are people trying to search for meteorites in Antarctica. You can see a little rock there. If you go to Antarctica, it's a whole bunch of ice. If you find a rock on the surface, it may have fallen from the sky. And the glaciers in Antarctica actually can collect meteorites over millions of years and push them together. And then when the, meteor when the glacier starts to melt, you start to discover the meteorites. When in the 1970s, the United States military said, we really want a presence in Antarctica. Well, international treaties said you can't have a military presence in Antarctica. So the Pentagon went to the NSF and said, you guys need to come up with science experiments to do in Antarctica. But the NSF doesn't have the ability to take scientists to Antarctica and keep them alive and ferry them back and forth. So the military, we can do that. We'll do it for you. And one of the very first experiments that the NSF decided to support was the Antarctic search for meteorites. And every year now, for 40 years, the NSF sends teams of people to Antarctica to search for meteorites. It's a, it's a great piece of science. But the reason we're doing it is because we're not allowed to have a military presence in Antarctica. So December 27, 1984. This is the rock she found. It's known as ALH 84001, Allen Hills 84001. Allen Hills because it was found in the Allen Hills region of Antarctica. 84 because it was found in 1984. And 8, 001 because it was the first of the meteorites found during that search season to be analyzed and classified and labeled. Glenn McPherson from the Smithsonian Museum in DC was in charge of analyzing these rocks, these meteorites for NASA. A little sliver of the meteorite would be sent from Johnson Space Center in Houston, where it was carefully curated to Smithsonian, Glenn McPherson would look at it and say, which category of meteorite does it fall in? Because meteoriticists had lots of different known categories of meteorites. And Glenn McPherson immediately saw that this was an igneous rock. An igneous rock comes from molten rock, right? It comes from lava, which solidifies into a rock. There are very few places in the solar system where you could make a rock from lava. You don't get any like that from the moon. 
You don't get any like that from Jupiter or Saturn. Every igneous rock, every igneous meteorite that we have in our collections shows exactly the same chemistry, exactly the same composition of minerals. They all come from the same parent body. And the parent body is Vesta. How do we know that? Vesta is a large asteroid in the asteroid belt. We can, ref we can see light from the sun that reflects off of the surface of Vesta. And we can look at the signature of the light, the fingerprints of the light that reflects off Vesta. You can shine light off of these meteorites that are igneous meteorites, and they're identical. These meteorites come from Vesta. So Glenn McPherson immediately identified this as a rock that came from Vesta. We had a bunch of those. Boring. Who cares? It just went into the collection and no one paid any attention to it. Yes, sir. How can you tell the difference between a meteorite like that, between whether it came from Ceres or Vesta? Ceres is also a big asteroid from which you could get igneous rocks. No, no doubt about that. But the reflected light off of Ceres, it looks different than the reflected light off of Vesta. And the reflected light off of the meteorites looks like Vesta and does not look like Ceres. So un unless we're being fooled somehow, the best interpretation is that all these rocks came from Vesta. That Vesta was hot inside. It formed these rocks from lava. The lava solidified into rock. Something hit Vesta and knocked a bunch of pieces off. And all those pieces, one by one, have gradually landed on Earth and we found them. And that that same event didn't happen to Ceres. Something may have happened to Ceres. Ceres would have formed these similar kinds of rocks. Something undoubtedly knocked pieces of Ceres off of Ceres. But those pieces are not on the Earth or at least we haven't found them yet. All right, two more meteorites found in Antarctica that are important. The one on the left is a big one. It weighs 17 pounds. EETA 79001 means it was found in the elephant moraine region of Antarctica. It was the first one classified and found in 1979. And the little one on the right, this is, I think, one centimeter on a side. This is a little rock that weighs an ounce. That is Allen Hill's 81005. When it was found in early 1982, it gets to be 1981 in its name because it was the 81-82 winter season. So it's an 81 meteorite. But this little meteorite on the right is the first meteorite that was known and proven to be from the moon. In the early 80s, there was a lot of controversy whether, about whether it was possible to get meteorites from other planets. The fact that we didn't have a single meteorite from the moon which would be easy to knock a piece off the moon and have it land on the Earth. If we don't have anything from the moon, then it must be impossible to get meteorites from other planets. This guy disproved that. This sort of broke the door and said, it is possible to get meteorites from the moon. And now we have a bunch of them. We know of a bunch of them. So maybe meteorites can come from somewhere else. Robert Pepin, who I think was at the University of Chicago where he did his work, he analyzed EETA 79001. EETA 7901 has little air bubbles inside. The little air bubbles have been bubbles inside that meteorite since it formed. And he analyzed the air in those bubbles, and he compared the vertical axis is how much stuff you have of certain elements, xenon, krypton, neon, argon-36, argon-40, nitrogen molecules, CO2 molecules. What is the proportion of that stuff in the air in the air bubbles? The bottom axis is how much you have in the little air bubble inside the meteorite. The vertical axis is how much you have in the atmosphere of Mars. Viking did experiments beyond the biology experiments. Viking landers measured what Mars' atmosphere is made of. And it turns out that the gas inside this meteorite is indistinguishable from a little balloon full of air from the atmosphere of Mars. It is distinguishable from the Earth's atmosphere. It's distinguishable from Venus's atmosphere. The moon has no atmosphere. The fact that this little bubble has Mars atmosphere in it says it's from Mars. That this lava formed on the surface of Mars, when it bubbled out to the surface, just from lo like lava from Kilauea in Hawaii, it traps some air inside it. The rock solidifies, and the little bubbles of Martian atmosphere are preserved. Something knocked this off of Mars. It came to the Earth. That air stayed in there until Robert Pepin drilled it out. This meteorite is from Mars. Therefore, it's possible for meteorites to be from Mars. 
David Middlefelt is the next person here in our story. He was a geochemist from Lockheed who was sort of on loan to NASA in Houston. And he used a device called an electron microprobe to study the x-rays that come from Allen Hills 84001. You take electrons. You have a, what's called the electron source here. It produces a beam of electrons, which you smash into your little piece of the meteorite, and x-rays come back, and you measure the x-rays. And the x-rays tell you what the rock is made of. He was doing an experiment on all of the rocks, all the meteorites that were supposedly from Vesta. And what he found is that this is the entire world's collection of igneous meteorites. And all of them look identical in the electron microprobe ex experiment except one. And that is Allen Hills 84001. And when he compared the x-ray fingerprints of his meteorite with EETA 79001 and a handful of other meteorites that are known as SNCs, SNCs, that were known to be by Mar from Mars by 1990. They'd been known to be from Mars. Allen Hills 84001 was clearly a Martian meteorite. SMC stands for Shasignites, Naclites, and something else. They're the three locations on the Earth where these little collections of Martian meteorites have been found. And all of the SNCs are fairly young, meaning compared to Mars, they're all 1.3 billion years old, as if they all were smashed off of Mars from the same formation at the same time. They flew around the solar system for a while, and a little pieces landed in France, and little pieces landed in India, and little pieces landed in Africa, and they were all found, and they're all from the same thing. And they all formed on the surface of Mars. Allen Hills 84001 is from Mars. It's got the Martian gas. It reflects the same chemistry, the same elemental constituents as the other Martian rocks. But Allen Hills 84001 formed a long time ago, 4.1 billion years ago, not 1.3 billion years ago. So lava flowed on Mars early on in Mars's history. And it formed at high pressure. So the minerals inside are different. High pressure means it formed inside Mars instead of on the surface of Mars. So it's a diff from a different place on Mars as the others but it's from Mars. And now Mar this meteorite was getting interesting. It got interesting enough that a handful of scientists did some other experiments on it. And in 1976, August 1996, excuse me, they published this paper in Science Magazine. David McKay is the leader of this team. Search for past life on Mars, possible relic biogenic activity in Martian meteorite ALH84001. They thought they had very strong evidence for Martian life inside this meteorite. In examining the Martian meteorite, we have found that the following evidence is compatible with the existence of past life on Mars. An igneous rock that was penetrated by a fluid along fractures and pore spaces, which then became the sites of secondary mineral formation and possible biogenic activity. So there were cracks in the, lava, in the rock, water flowed in, it brought Martian bacteria in. The bac Martian bacteria lived in these cracks and produced stuff. And some of the stuff they produced, they're detecting. That's the claim. A formation age for the carbonate globules is younger than the age of the rock. So again, water infiltrated the rock, and these things called carbonate globules formed. There are images of the carbonate globules and features resembling terrestrial microorganisms, terrestrial biogenic carbonate structures, or microfossils, and four minerals called magnetite and iron sulfide particles that could have resulted from oxidation and reduction reactions known to be important in terrestrial microbial systems. And then they, they said there's the presence of molecules called PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, that are associated with the surfaces that are rich in these carbonate globules. None of these observations is in itself conclusive for the existence of past life Although there are alternative explanations for each of these phenomena, taken individually when they are considered collectively, particularly in view of their spatial association, we conclude that they are evidence for primitive life on Mars, on early Mars, 4.1 billion years ago. This was a press conference on August 7, 1996. The press conference was one of the most unusual press conferences that I know of because the main part of the press conference was held in NASA headquarters with a panel of scientists and reporters. But the press conference actually pick, picked off, started off right here on the south lawn of the White House with Bill Clinton, 
saying, introducing everything and saying, it is well worth contemplating how we reach this moment of discovery. More than four billion years ago, this piece of rock was formed as a part of the original crust of Mars. After billions of years, it broke from the surface and began a 16 million year journey through space that would end here on Earth. It arrived in a meteor shower 13,000 years ago, and in 1984, an American scientist on an annual U.S. government mission to search for meteors, that should be meteorites, on Antarctica picked it up and took it to be studied. Appropriately, it was the first rock to be picked up that year. Today, ALH 84001 speaks to us across all those billions of years and millions of miles. It speaks of the possibility of life. If this discovery is confirmed, it will surely be one of the most stunning insights into our universe that science has ever uncovered. Its implications are as far-reaching and awe-inspiring as can be imagined. Okay. <laughs> then it transitions to the main press conference. So what are those four lines of evidence that are so important in this meteorite? As we read a moment ago, there are these things called carbonate globules. There are minerals that are associated with the carbonate globules. There are elongated tube-like structures that look like fossil bacteria. And then there are these things called PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These are the globules, the carbonate globules, these orange-looking globules. Right? This is an electron microscope image of them. There are lots of them. This little bar here, 100 microns across. These are significant in size. I think we said a few weeks ago, human hair is you know, 25, 30, 40 microns in width, not length. Mine are about that in length. Okay. The minerals associated with the carbonate globules include these little things here, which are probably magnetite. These guys up here, which are something else. These are, as they're described, ovoid in diameter. There are tubular shapes also present, and we'll see those tubular shapes in the next image. Here's one of those tubular things. Okay. Does it look tubular to you? Okay. Here's some more tubular shapes. This one in the middle, right down the middle there. And then I think we've got a close-up of the most famous one of these. That little guy kind of looks like a worm, right? Segmented worm. So maybe there are worm-like bacteria on Mars. I think we have one more image here, lots of them. Lots of these guys. So what's going on? So let's start with those worms. These worms are 20 to 40 nanometers wide. Nanometers, not microns. They're rod-shaped structures composed of carbon-bearing molecules that resemble rod-shaped bacteria. That's indisputable. They resemble rod-shaped bacteria. They bear carbon, indisputable. They are tiny, indisputable. They, they are tubular, rope-like structures that look like certain kinds of terrestrial bacteria. The problem is they're incredibly tiny, incredibly tiny. There's no known bacterium on Earth that is that small. In 1998, the National Academy of Sciences convened a panel of experts to try to decide whether these little things could be fossil bacteria. They said no. Free living organisms require a minimum of 250 to 450 proteins, along with the genes and ribosomes necessary for their synthesis. Now, in response to an earlier question, we're thinking about Earth-like life. Are we capable of understanding whether life could exist in some different way? Probably not. But in understanding how Earth, life on Earth works, you need a membrane that contains stuff. And that stuff, you need a certain number of molecules that do certain things to make it alive. And they said a sphere capable of holding this minimal molecular complement would be 250 to 300 nanometers in diameter, including its bounding membrane they concluded that this stuff is not bacteria, not fossils of living things. Again, David McKay and a couple of his co-authors of that original paper, they will continue to argue with you till the cows come home that this conclusion is wrong. But the overwhelming consensus of the scientific community at this time is that those rod-like structures are interesting rod-like structures, but they have nothing to do with life. 
What about those carbonate globules? There's no doubt that they're orange, they're pancake shaped, they're carbonate. They make up 1% of the entire mass of this meteorite. They are very rich in, material, in minerals that contain this ion, CO3 minus 2, so it's lost to electrons. This globule almost certainly formed in a water-rich environment. You don't get these things unless they form in the presence of water. That's pretty neat in and of itself because it does tell us that 4.1 billion years ago, Mars had wet patches. How much, this doesn't tell us, but it had wet patches. These globules form in the same environment in the meteorite as those mineral grains that are thought to be of biological origin by at least the authors of this paper. The big problem with these globules is they almost certainly formed at a very high temperature, <coughs> temperatures greater than the boiling point of water, which strongly suggests they are non-biological precipitates rather than the result of biology. And again, a very strong consensus exists that these have nothing to do with biology. That consensus could be wrong, but that's the scientific consensus right now. What about the PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons? These are molecules that have these cyclic ring-shaped chains in which carbon molecules are attached to each other. There are lots and lots, thousands of these things. PAHs contain carbon and oxygen. They're organic molecules. One of the authors of the paper, Richard Zare, said they very much resemble what you'd expect when you have simple organic matter decay. So if I take the broccoli in my kitchen and I throw out in the garden and it decays, you will get PAHs from it. The claim by this team was these PAHs formed from the diag diagenesis, the decomposition of microorganisms. One of the problems with this interpretation is that as an astronomer, you give me a telescope, tell me which direction to look, I'll find you PAHs. You can find them in the atmosphere of Titan. You can find them in molecular clouds in between the stars. You can find them in the, gi the atmospheres of red giant stars, in planetary nebula. We find them in other meteorites. We find them pretty much everywhere. PAHs are robust throughout the entire universe. You don't need life to make them. They're not hard to find. In fact, they are hard not to find. But they could be from the diagenesis of biological material. The consensus is that since PAHs are everywhere, there is no reason to think these PAHs come from life, even if they could. So they are almost certainly contamination from some other source and not biological in origin. And that leaves only thing standing, and that's these magnetite crystals. Certain bacteria grow little magnetic grains inside them, magnetite crystals, and they use them to orient themselves with respect to the Earth's magnetic field. It's how they know how to swim in certain directions. Certain other animals have magnetite crystals in their brains. Magnetite crystals in ALH 4001 are similar to magnetite grains that are found in so-called magnetotactic bacteria on Earth. Are the crystals similar in sizes and shapes and crystallography to those found in magnetic crystals in magnetotactic bacteria on Earth? McKay's team says yes. Other teams have looked at the same magnetic, magnetite crystals and said no. There's considerable variety in the magnetite crystals in ALH84001 in their structure, in their morphology, in what they're made of, which means it's very difficult to confirm that they have a biological origin just by comparing them with terrestrial magnetite crystals in terrestrial magnetotactic bacteria. So the consensus is that the only thing from ALH84001, which might be evidence of biology, are these magnetite crystals, although the evidence for them remains very weak. But as with the evidence from the Viking landers, while the consensus is they're not evidence of life, that's not indisputable. It is still possible that some of this is evidence of life, which means the jury is still out. Okay? <laughs>
We don't know the answer. But it's incredibly interesting evidence that forces me at least to say, we cannot simply say there's no life on Mars, because there might be. We might have that evidence already, which is in large part why NASA is so busy looking for additional evidence of life on Mars. There might be life on Mars. All right. That's it. Next week, last week, next week's all about methane on Mars. All right. Questions? Vesta. Okay. Eight four zero zero one. The initial, the initial claim wasn't that Vesta had this. That eight four zero zero one had the same reflected light signature as the other meteorites. The original claim was that eight four zero zero one was made of igneous minerals. And therefore, it came from a place that can make igneous rocks. And the only place we knew about in the solar system in 1984 that could make igneous rocks and whose gravity was weak enough that you could knock rocks off the surface and get those meteorites to Earth was Vesta. Later on, when they did the reflected light off of the meteorite and when they did the crystallography, the X-ray crystallography, that's when they saw there actually were considerable differences between ALH84001 and the SNCs, the other Martian meteorites. All right? So the only similarity is that they both are made of igneous materials. Okay. It's a good question. Other questions? Stump the astronomer. Come on. <laughs> Sir. The Viking land, yeah. Four billion years ago. That's great. If Mars's atmosphere has changed over 4 billion years, why would the gas bubble trapped in a meteorite that formed 4 billion years ago be identical to a gas bubble formed in a meteorite 1.3 billion years ago, which is identical to the gases of Mars's atmosphere today? And the answer has to be that Mars's atmosphere hasn't changed that much in terms of the ratios of these elements to each other. Right? That's what they're really measuring. Mars has lost some of its nitrogen. It's lost more nitrogen 14 than nitrogen 15. Most of them. Yeah, argon, krypton, xenon. Yeah. And those are heavy. Krypton hasn't been lost. Xenon hasn't been lost. So most of those haven't been lost. The, the question, nevertheless, it's a really good question. It does tell us something important about the evolution of Mars's atmosphere that in terms of the composition of those different elements and materials, it hasn't changed very much over 4 billion years. You then have to take that answer and compare it with these other answers we talked about a few weeks ago that says Mars has been losing stuff to space. And you've got to find a way to put those together and either decide that something's wrong or that they're compatible answers. I, I don't know how much people have thought hard enough about how compatible those answers are. Do we know how thick Mars's crust is to look for samples? We haven't looked very deep yet. We've you know, looked a few centimeters into the surface. We've got little drill bits on the Curiosity rover that you know, drill a centimeter in. That's as far as we've looked so far. How thick is the regolith or the dirt layer on Mars that could have fossils, that could have bones in it? We don't know. We have no idea. I think. Next generations of explorers on Mars, robotic explorers or otherwise, they will want to dig. How deep they can dig, I don't know. I think the, the ExoMars rover 
or the Mars 2020 rover is designed, I think, to be able to drill six meters deep, which is pretty good. But we haven't done that yet. Charlie. One more time about uh, the light that might exist at 4.1 billion years ago. Uh, is there any comparison to the early years or early millions of years, uh, billions of years of Mars, which is distant from our distance, which would indicate that maybe the life had gotten started and was seamless, whereas on Earth it uh, had started with a few years of light shining in the uh, okay. Since the Allen Hills meteorite formed 4.1 billion years ago, at that time on Earth, there were hardly any rocks at all. The Earth was a hotter place that hadn't developed solid, significant solid crustal regions 4.1 billion years ago. Apparently, Mars had. Maybe so Mars could have gotten a head start. So maybe life could have started on Mars and got kicked off to Earth that way. However, the life, if there's life in the meteorite, the life in the meteorite isn't 4.1 billion years ago. The, the rock formed 4.1 billion years ago. That's from the radioactive isotope dating of the rock. At some point later on, cracks formed in the rock. Water flowed into the cracks. That water transported into the rock, according to the folks who believe this, bacteria, Martian bacteria which then produced and left behind some of this detritus, the magnetite grains, the carbonate globules, the PAHs. We don't actually have a date for when the liquid penetrated the cracks. We just know the meteorite itself was born 4.1 billion years ago. So the, the liquid could have penetrated the cracks 4 billion years ago, 3.9, 3.5, 3 billion years ago. I don't actually, I could look that up. I don't have a date for that. I'm not sure they have a date for that. Probably a long time ago, but the only real date for that rock that's solid is the rock itself formed 4.1 billion years ago. When the cracks formed, when the liquid penetrated the cracks, we don't know that. There's a question over here. Are we going to explore the caves? Have we been able to? We have not yet explored any caves. To my knowledge, we have not yet found any caves to explore. We have pictures from satellites, which have you know, good resolution on the surface, but that doesn't tell you there's a cave there. right? I think the only way to find caves is to get on the surface and explore a lot. The first rovers have gone you know, 30 feet. The Curiosity rover is in the Gale Crater, and it's exploring a significant volume of the Gale Crater, but that's just one part of one crater on Mars. So we have not explored much of Mars in a way that would enable us to find caves that we would want to explore. I think that's an important next step, to have dune buggies on Mars that can you know, really travel, and have cameras on the dune buggies that would enable us to say, that looks like a cave. And then maybe on that dune buggy, you've got some little drones that you send out your fleet of drones to see if they can go in the cave and see what they can see. We have the ability to design those spacecraft and design those drones and send those robot, robotic spacecraft to Mars to do these searches. But no, we, don't, we have not yet explored any caves. We have not yet found any caves. Can you dis discover something about the thickness of the crust from gravitational differences? The s satellites in orbit around the planet can discover what are called gravitational anomalies, where the gravity is a little bit stronger here and a little bit weaker here. And that means the rock here is a little bit denser, and the rock here is a little bit lighter. On Earth, that's a signature of mountains versus deep trenches in the ocean. Deep trenches in the ocean, the lowest elevation places on the Earth, are strong gravity signatures. And the mountains, which are high, which sounds like there's more mass there, are low gravity signatures. Because in order to hold up that big mountain, the mountain has to be light. But those gravity signatures are giving you indications about big hunks of rock, not little caves. Orbiters around the moon discovered very early on what are called mass cons, mass concentrations on the moon, which are probably large buried iron asteroids. 
So when you pass over the mass con, the, the spacecraft gets pulled a little bit harder. Its orbit speeds up just a little bit. And that tells you there's a little bit mass, a little bit more mass right below you. We don't see a big hunk of iron sitting on the surface, so there's probably a big hunk of iron buried beneath the surface. But it doesn't tell us there's a hollow spot for a cave. That would be too small a gravity signature. It would be an imaginative way to work, but I don't think we can do it. Good question here. Are there plans to send probes to the poles on Mars? We did, yes. We sent one to the poles of Mars a long time ago, and it crashed and burned. We, there was a, a miscommunication between the European component and the US-made component on how much fuel to inject to settle it down on the surface, and it blew it up. That was one attempt. We did send another one that landed near the interface between the polar cap and the non-polar cap region, but just one. I don't think there are any plans right now to send any more, but there are certainly people who want to do that. All right. I'm out of time. My moderator says stop. I'm not going away. If you've got questions, come ask me. See you next week.